Hello and welcome or welcome back to the Live Label Free Podcast. Today I am speaking to Anna Marie, a fellow autistic female who is recovered from an eating disorder. Anna Marie had been following me in my journey for quite some time now and actually reached out to share her story on the podcast. I believe there is nothing more powerful and inspiring than hearing other people's lived experience. So I of course said yes and am so excited for you to listen to our conversation. That being said, if you, dear listener, would like to be a guest on the Live Label Free podcast, I would love to chat. So please send me a message at livelabelfree.com forward slash contact. You can also send me a message on Instagram at livelabelfree. And without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Anna Marie. Welcome to Live Label Free, the podcast, where you'll learn to let go of limiting labels and embrace your unique brain. As my mom says so beautifully in her song, which is why on this podcast, you'll learn the scientific links between neurodiversity and eating disorders giving you a deeper understanding of how you can face your fears and become truly free. Together, you and me, we will keep putting one foot in front of the other. Today, I have Anna Marie on the show. So welcome, Anna Marie. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm I'm really excited to talk to you about all things autism and eating disorders and for you to share your story and insights with our listeners. So that being said, um, can you start off by sharing who are you and what is your story? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm yeah, like you said, I'm Anna Marie. I'm twenty six years old and um so my story, um, I relate a lot to what you kind of when I was reading through your posts and kind of following you, I relate to a lot of what you um, have gone through too. I'm um, recently, I discovered I was autistic about two years ago um, and had an eating disorder for a long time before that. Um, And um, so it's kind of that journey has been very similar um, learning kind of about how those things work together and why, you know, um, my eating disorder even started and could have been influenced by um, a lot of um, just the autism traits that I had and, and that, those kinds of things. Um, and yeah, I just graduated from, from graduate school. So I'm a speech language pathologist working with the little, so I work with like zero to three year olds and it's been great too, because I've been with families so much through the process of diagnosing autism. So being there to support families too, through that, and even sharing some of my experiences has been really like a, an amazing experience too. So it's cool to kind of go on this journey for myself, but also like help families through that as well. So yeah, if I may interrupt with the speech language pathologist, um, do you work with a lot of autistic kids? I do. I would say like 50 to 60 percent of the kiddos I work with. Yeah. Are autistic. Yeah. I mean, that overlap is is just so striking. Like there's got to be a link there Um, mm-hmm. because when I was little, I mean, I would say that my voice is still very distinct in, in a way. Like <laughs> I feel like, you know, some people have like really specific voices that you've never heard anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um. And I would definitely say that I have one of those voices. Um, Mm -hmm. And I know that when I was younger, I had like this really, not bad, but just like pretty very obvious lisp. And Mm -hmm. people would like, but I couldn't hear it, obviously, because I was the one talking. Um, But people would often comment about it. Like she has a very interesting like intonation and and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would talk really loud (laughs) when it was not appropriate. Um, yep. and other times people would be like I can barely hear you um, mm-hmm. I never went to any kind of speech therapy because I, I am pretty sure that you know I was very quote-unquote high functioning as a kid so I kind of took in the feedback of you're talking too loud you're talking too quiet and I mm-hmm. masked like a lot and I kind yeah. of figured out how to act like and and to say as little as possible but then when I 
did have to say I was like super aware of like okay is my tone right like mm. how say these words you know um yeah. not using words that I knew I wasn't good at pronouncing kind of thing um so so yeah I'm I mean this this is a conversation I, I feel like already I'd love to have you back on the podcast for another time um, because it's totally a side tangent. But yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's really beautiful how, you know, you've taken your own story with being autistic, um, probably not related to the eating disorder as much. Um, but I feel like at some point, you know, you just want to completely leave that behind you. Yeah. Um, but being able to, you know, work with people and help families understand their child, um, I, I think that's like the epitome of like turning your mess into your message. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, you kind of showed, um, you were di- diagnosed two years ago, um, with autism and you had an eating disorder before that. Can you kind of share when your eating disorder started, like when you started first kind of fucking with your food? <laughs> yeah, right. Say. Um, and then how, how you believe that like the autism tied into those behaviors? Sure. Yeah. So um, my eating disorder started probably about seventh or eighth grade. Um, and it kind of started with health class. So we were learning about Same. You, know, <laughs> you too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was we were learning about nutrition and just what nutrition labels were. And I, I remember this in health class always, I always took things very literally and was like, okay, like, they said this, so this might, you know, must be so um I just started learning about what nutrition was and like what fats and sugars were and how to read nutrition labels. And I became, it became almost like a special interest looking back now, I would say, like became obsessed with it eventually. And it just kind of grew and grew to the point where, and I would do it and and just feel like this almost like rush from like doing it. And just like, it just became very obsessive and then more and more restrictive. And then, but yeah, it was weird. Cause like, you know, I just didn't, see it at all at that point and of course we just think we're being healthy right (laughs) exactly right yeah Yeah. so um so that was like part of it but um anyway I got better after like eighth grade or ninth grade but it wasn't fully gone which was Mm -hmm. kind of I think the more dangerous part of it um because like I looked healthy in high school and college I I looked like there was nothing wrong with you know going on with me but those thoughts were still there all throughout that time and um there were a lot of like secretive behaviors that I would do like binging and restricting and just not going to social things at all because I was just nervous about the social piece of it, but also mm-hmm. just like um, the fact that I didn't know what was going to be served there, what was going to happen there. Yeah. And so it, it really restricted my life in ways that, um, yeah, just consumed a lot of my thoughts, I think too, when I was um, around that time and it just like restricted the amount of friends that I was having. And so, yeah. Um, affected my life in ways I didn't see, but, um, but so that was part of it. And then, um, when COVID hit, um, I graduated, I was starting graduate school and I had another pretty bad relapse. And it was at that point where I realized like, this has still been going on. And, and, um, when I learned about what eating disorders were, and I, I started watching this video of this, um, channel, which I loved, um, called Makes You Recovery. And I like, Oh yeah. I know that. I know that channel. Yeah. 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 She was, I, she was great. I loved her stuff. Like, um, yeah, I remember watching the first video of hers and I was just shocked because it was like, she was describing all of the thoughts that I had Uh and I thought were just me. Um, so like, so it was just kind of crazy. And I realized, Oh, these aren't just me. And these aren't like, valid thoughts <laughs> like they're not well I think you know they're valid they're just not um productive they they don't lead mm-hmm. us to live the life that's in alignment with their values right um yeah. because obviously they're, they're there they serve a purpose in some way because if they served even the eating disorder if the eating disorder served absolutely zero purpose we mm-hmm. would have let it go a long time ago right um right. but obviously it it is doing something for you. <laughs> um, but I, the realization of, I think when we understand that the purpose it's serving is, is unhealthy, right? It's not mm. bringing us to where we want to go. It's not supporting a life that we want to live. That's when you can kind of realize and become aware of like, oh, maybe I should look for something else to, you know, fulfill this purpose and kind yeah. of piggyba- piggybacking off that. Um, You used this one word, you said, Um, you know, the the healthy eating and the labels and the controlling food, it gave me a rush. Like almost, I describe Mm. it in my book almost as like a sense of euphoria. Um, And, and I would, I really tie that back to, you know, the the dopamine, Um, which, Mm. as I'm sure you know, like, 
dopamine in in neurodiversity has ab I don't want to say abnormal because normal is so subjective, but like mm-hmm. we have atypical levels of dopamine and other you know neurotransmitters, and I think that that leads us, you know, to seek out dopamine in, in other ways and perhaps more frequently um, and more almost excessively. Like it almost seems like we need more stimulation, more of a high to get the same, get our dopamine needs met basically. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, like people talk all about ADHD and dopamine, but I mean, I'm doing my own, a lot of my own research too about eating and how that plays in like the reward systems that play into that um and you know the body is so incredibly complex that we really cannot attribute you know certain behaviors to one specific neurotransmitter or one specific hormone um yeah, but yeah I, I feel like I'm I'm kind of go- going off topic here um but but yeah what you said about you know that that rush feeling um mm. I'm curious how when you you know realize like this whole eating disorder thing in your relapse it it's really not gone it's still really here um and you started watching these recovery videos and um people really validated your thoughts in a way like these you have these thoughts you're not alone with these thoughts what are kind of the next steps that you took to get where you are today yeah yeah so for me I think it kind of ended a lot in the way that it started. So I, my special interest, instead of becoming nutrition stuff became recovery. So I, um, I watched a lot of videos Mm -hmm. and it just became like, for me, I just kind of studied it. I kind of studied it and like, how, how do I do this? And like, I looked for, cause I think that's how my brain works. Like just, I looked for like a, not a formula, but like a way to help me through. So like, if I, okay, I'm going to do this, challenge myself with this food or this behavior. And then I'm going to, I'm going to work through this feeling. And I just like seeing someone else go through that, um, yeah. which, um, was really helpful to see what does this look like? Um, cause that's kind of like, I just like study and I, I imitate a lot. Um, so I feel like for me, that's kind of how I took that approach. Um, so that was a lot of it, just kind of studying it. Um, and then doing it very more gradually. So like some people go like, kind of like all in and we'll do everything all at once. But for me, I felt like I needed to do it a little more more slowly for myself, Mm -hmm. um, to give myself time to kind of adjust. Cause it would been, it had been a long time that I'd built up these thoughts and behaviors. So, um, just kind of working on those things slowly too, and giving myself time and a lot of grace, um, which was the hardest piece of it. But yeah, I I think the grace, especially for us autistic people, you know, that we have been conditioned, you know, to be perfect at everything, to, to want everyone to like us almost as like compensation in a way to, cover up what we believe people perceive as like lacking um Mm. and yeah I I find it I find it funny I'm I'm, like chuckling within myself about you know the I studied (laughs) recovery um because I feel like there are two two sides to that and I feel like it it can be tricky um when you get really caught up in that because for me it was at, at one point like okay I'm gonna do this whole recovery thing and for years I you know read all the recovery blogs, I read all the recovery books, I followed everyone on Instagram, hashtag, you know, ED recovery. And, and I was, but I was almost tricking myself into doing recovery just because I was Mm. studying it. And just because I was reading it. Well, in the meantime, I was actively still engaging in my eating disorder. Um, And I feel like, you know, that's kind of where we psych ourselves out of like, I'm in recovery, I'm in recovery. But reading about recovery, like, isn't, actually doing it and it's that that whole idea of like you're not gonna learn how to walk by reading a book on walking like a baby Mm -hmm. like learned how to walk by walking falling down being like okay if I hold my balance differently next time then maybe I'll have a better chance of you know taking a few extra steps um so I'm I'm curious because you said like I did a lot of studying and um I want to touch back on the all-in versus gradual in a moment um but what helped you to actually take action because obviously Mm. you wouldn't be here today if you were only doing the studying (laughs) like clearly there were some action steps or a lot of action steps that you took um so what would you say are kind of the the biggest shifts the biggest changes in your behavior that you made to go from this place of like uh fear and limitation restriction to you know feeling more peaceful and at ease around food and exercise and 
everything that you know an eating disorder messes up <laughs> yeah right um no and I totally agree with what you're saying I I experienced a similar thing where I I was studying in the beginning and mm-hmm. I was like yeah I'm doing this and then I looked back and I was like not I, my behaviors aren't changing and nothing's really changing so I I totally yeah. get that I think for me um a big part of it was self-reflection so taking time for myself writing down what actual rules I had in my head that I never actually listed out. So for me, writing down Mm -hmm. all the rules in my head and just seeing the number of rules. And then I would just kind of, I took very strategically, like I would take like one or two rules and I would just kind of try to focus on that for the next week or two Mm -hmm. and just kind of like, okay. And then just kind of like incorporate it as, as I go, because, you know, it takes a long time to go away and and it comes back and you you hear those thoughts again. You're like, wait, I have to challenge this rule again. Like it's coming back. So yeah. So I think writing things down for me really helped me to be able mm-hmm. to actually work on those things rather than just learning about kind of what, um, how to do it, just actually finding a plan and making a plan. So writing things down was helpful for me. I love that you brought up the writing things down um, because I'm very similar in a way. And I think that's mm-hmm. kind of why I love writing so much um, mm-hmm. is because unlike well, when I talk, I tend to talk very fast. Um, mm. And I often like have people say like, Olivia, like slow down. You were talking so fast. I cannot keep up. And I'm like, you can't keep up. <laughs> like, <laughs> the reason I talk fast is because my thoughts are going so fast all the time. And yes. I almost yeah. like try to keep up with the thoughts um, mm-hmm. by talking really fast. But then I always lose my train of thought anyways. Um, Like all of my clients can attest to me just talking for like three minutes straight and being like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, Because I'll just like lose what I was saying. And then we both laugh because it just all it happens to all of us all the time. Um, But with writing, it's it's really magical because um, I'm a very visual person and like almost every autistic person I've met is a visual person as well. Um, and there actually have been like brain studies indicating that the autistic, um, the visual processing center in the brains of autistic people is actually like enlarged, which hmm. like explains a lot. Um, yeah. But of course, many of these studies are done on like autistic boys that are so-called severely autistic. And I'm like, we're exploding like a majority of the population so when it comes to research like I'm always still skeptical (laughs) um but but yeah like when it comes to writing I feel like that visual aspect does play a really important role because when I'm writing and I've written something and then I have another thought I don't lose my train of thought because I can Mm. reflect back on what I've written before and I'm like oh that's the direction I was going in and then it like brings me back on track um So I also loved, you know, that you said I listed out rules and like tackled a few at a time. And I'm assuming that was kind of the the gradual approach versus I'm just going to break every single rule right now and like not care at all. Um, Yeah, I I do think for autistic people, like everyone's unique, obviously, and what works for one person doesn't work for the other. But I do feel like that approach of like, I'm going to throw everything out the window and just start a whole new life right now, right here. Like, I just feel like that's not really possible for the minds that need everything to be like, we need to have an overview. And I think you really don't have that. You don't have that sense of trust and safety if you're going to just suddenly let go of everything that gave you safety for such a long time. Yeah. Um. So I loved, I love that, you know, you, you wrote it down and you kind of, became aware for yourself of like this is what I have to work on and then also being really honest with yourself at like when it wasn't working or when you were falling back to say okay I need to go back and bring this back to like uh, a conscious you know point of focus because in the end covering from an eating disorder and, and life in general it, it isn't a race it is all about you know taking consistent action over time um the example I love is like the people that that climbed Mount Everest didn't didn't jump to the top like from the bottom like oh we're just gonna jump to the top we're gonna go all in and just reach them like it doesn't work that way like every single step of the journey mattered because every Mm. single step was like a journey that strengthened them and gave them more confidence of look how far I've already come like I can keep doing this I can keep going and I do believe that that is what makes recovery from eating disorder or recovery from any you know mental illness all the more admirable it's because you know how hard you had to work to get there Mm -hmm. um 
And in a sense, you know, I think that's also what keeps you recovered and keeps you from going back. Because for me, like, even though I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back, even if it was easy, (laughs) so to say, because I mean, I wasn't living. I, I, at this point, I'm like, I have done way too much work to get where I am today to Mm -hmm. ever, you know, choose a life of smallness, I guess, ever again. (laughs) Have you listened to my free audio training yet? If not, you have got to get your booty over to my website right now and download the audio training, Three Steps to Recovery from an Eating Disorder as an Autistic Person. If there is one question I get asked the most when it comes to autism and eating disorders, it's whether or not I believe it's harder for an autistic person to recover from an eating disorder. The fact that this is such a common question is really no surprise as autistic traits are often the root cause of the disordered eating behaviors. I believe my own eating disorder was simply a manifestation of my autism. Obsessive interests, the need for predictability and routine, difficulty with change, being sensitive, As soon as you mix food and exercise into this autistic assemblage of traits, it's literally a recipe for an eating disorder. So then how does an autistic individual approach recovery from an eating disorder? Well, that is exactly what you will learn in my free audio training. While listening, you'll be guided through three simple steps to give you the clarity and confidence you need to use your autism to your advantage in recovery. It's like having a private coaching session with me on demand. To listen to the free training, all you have to do is head over to livelabelfree.com forward slash free dash audio training and you'll be on your way to learning the skills to fully recover from an eating disorder as an autistic person. Achieving a state of full recovery from an eating disorder will be a different journey than for someone who is not autistic but that doesn't mean it has to be harder. I did it which means you can too. Now let's get back to today's episode. Yeah, I I am curious just for listeners because I'm sure they're thinking now like, but what were some of these rules? You know, what were some of the action mm-hmm. steps you took to challenge these rules? Um, can you maybe just list out like a few different rules um that were were very strong and and kind of the action steps you took to to overcome them? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the rules they they evolved and changed over time. Of course, like yeah. um. I had this period where when I learned about what calories were and I read on one online website about how much for my height, weight and age I was supposed to have. And I took oh that God. number very literally. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I and, I remember uh, those those calorie counters always like indicate like a quarter of my knee. Right? It's like oh a gosh. joke. Yeah. It was. I know because I would I would do it and I'd be like, I feel horrible. But this I would is be what I'm starving. To do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So So that was one thing I had. Um, But then other rules around like, it was a lot of nutritional content for me. So like um, desserts, like I can only have one dessert. Sometimes at one point it was like one dessert, like a week or one dessert a day. Um, Because over time the rules just get more and more like strict. And then it's like no desserts at all, no sugar at all, no added sugars. Yeah, yeah, Um, because that's how my eating sort of started too in... I mean, I write about this like extensively in Rainbow Girl, but it was like mm. during fifth grade nutrition class, we were learning about the food pyramid before, you know, Michelle Obama became president and introduced <laughs> my plate. Um, right. And and like the this very small section on the pyramid of like oil and sugar. And yes. I just remember learning like obesity is a huge problem in the US and in the world. And just more and more kids are becoming obese because we're eating too much chips and candy and And then we, you know, we were taught, like, if you eat too much sugar, too much candy or whatever, you are going to become obese. And I took that so literally. And actually, (laughs) I have this one sentence in my book that was like, I wrote it down in my black and white composition notebook just to like (laughs) add that extra effect. Um, Because it was, it was like one of those, you know, speckled notebooks. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You can get that like staple. (laughs) Um, I loved school stopping as a kid. Um, And I would, you know, write down like, no sugar like exercise 
60 minutes at least per day yep. um because otherwise i'm gonna get like heart failure and all these things mm-hmm. that obviously are, are just complete bullshit when taken out of context but yeah. i think this is also why you know we need more awareness um for teachers and just in the education system because the teachers they're only spitting out what they were told to tell kids <laughs> right yeah. they don't know any better they don't have anything to sort of <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, maybe they do, but you know, I I don't know. But um, yeah. So um, yeah. I I just wanted to add that. So sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, no, it's so true. <laughs> um, yeah. With exercise, when you said that, I was like, yeah, I definitely have a lot of rules about that. Again, kind of the literal, like exercise thirty minutes a day. So if yeah. I don't get in thirty minutes, that's not good. Um, so things are like that. Um, and just like quantities of food too I think were like something for me like I would look and see on a plate or I would kind of see what other people were eating and if I was eating more than them and I was like oh I can't do that like so or like if I eat less than someone then that that dopamine rush you know you get that so yeah so that's kind of just some of the things I guess yeah the 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 comparison oh my gosh that was (laughs) I remember at dinner one time you know my mom was putting macaroni and cheese on my sister's plates and I obviously had my gluten-free lentil pasta and (laughs) I steamed tofu and steamed broccoli and just everything, you know, little calories as possible. I was also like vegetarian at the time. It was the Mm. whole, I think my, my, what eventually initially started as just like restriction just really turned into like restriction mixed with like extreme orthorexia like Mm. um I actually recorded a video for my sister today and sent it to her how I went to the store yesterday to get brownies because I really wanted brownies but I could not be like bothered to like bake any so I just like went and got some store-bought brownies and I was like eating them and I was like um I was making a video for and I was saying like I cannot like sometimes it's so crazy to think about like how now I just like nonchalantly will go to the store, <laughs> buy like an entire box of brownies and just like, mm. just like eat however many I want. And then yeah. I was telling her like, yeah, it's crazy to think that like seven years ago, I was eating like fucking date brownies. <laughs> I um, did that too. <laughs> yeah, because everything, like everything that I craved, it had to be like a healthy alternative. And yes. you start believing at some point too, like that, that the alternative is the same thing like I remember Mm -hmm. I had this whole like just like it was low-key like food hoarding just this entire Mm -hmm. bar of protein bars in like every flavor and every brand you can ever imagine Mm -hmm. um and because we live in the we live in the Netherlands and I I did at the time when you know my eating disorder was really bad too um I, you know, you can't get many of the protein bars here in Europe because most of them are are made in the U.S. And I would have the protein bars shipped from the U.S. to here, which would cost like $50, you know, for a package. And because I was like, I need my protein bars. And it was funny because whenever I was like, oh, you know, I want some Oreos. So my sisters would be eating Oreos. I'm like, look, guys, I have Oreos, too. I'm eating a cookies and cream quest bar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and like, it's funny, yeah. because after I did recovery, and like, didn't eat any of those things anymore. Um, I remember eating a quest bar like years later, and I just I spit it out. I was like, this is absolutely disgusting. I cannot even believe that I convinced myself I enjoyed eating this. Um, oh my gosh, yeah. Like, yeah, like even <laughs> now, like, you know, I do like healthy baking, quote unquote, healthy baking. And my cookbook, No She No Diversity, has like a lot of recipes, like sweet potato brownies or like, um, yeah, I love sweet potato, like sweet potato ice cream mm. and like um, protein bars made with dates and stuff. Um, yeah. But I'm ne- I can never convince myself and I will never convince myself anymore that it's like a replacement for the real thing. Um, mm. So, yeah, I, I mean, I really do. It is really important for, for anyone, you know, if you have food rules around, like you can only eat, quote unquote, clean and healthy Um, to to challenge, you know, like, are, do you really believe this? Do you really mm. taste? Does it really taste the same? Or are you just tricking yourself into that? Just just like almost cling to the eating disorder and have an excuse to not challenge yourself um because yeah I'm sure you experienced this but a huge part of recovery for me was being brutally honest with myself Mm. like um and and yeah kind of going back to that comparison story I would I would get so mad um 
that mac and cheese story like my mom put mac and cheese on their plates and i was like i'm not eating dinner until you put more mac and cheese on their plates and my mom was like olivia like you can't compare you you're not even eating the mac and cheese like you have your (laughs) gluten-free freaking lentil pasta like what are you talking about (laughs) and i was like no but i i can't like i cannot eat if you do not eat like if they don't eat more like if it's not clearly more and i i had a total full full-blown panic attack that night because I was also super Mm. malnourished and I I was just jumping up and down like a wild animal and (laughs) my sisters at one point it got so bad that my sisters just like were like trembling in the corner they were so afraid Mm. of me and 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 you know like upon reflect because in that moment you're so sick you're so in the illness that you don't even realize how fucked up it is but like now when I look back I'm like I literally became like a wild threatening animal because mm. my sisters were not eating more mac and cheese. Like if oh, that's yeah. not like really disordered, <laughs> um, I don't know what it is. So yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing about like the comparison and kind of the rules. Um, I again, like you said about when you discovered Megsy recovery, in the end, I feel like we all have the same thoughts and the same rules to some extent. Um, and it can be so validating to know you're not alone because yeah. when you, you know, hear stories about people being recovered, you know, well, if they had those rules and now don't anymore, it must also be possible for, for me. Um, yeah. So kind of with the comparison rule, um, to take that as an example, how yeah. how did you work on kind of challenging that and, you know, being able to stay in your own lane and eat what you need to eat? Mm. Oh my gosh, that was probably one of the hardest things in recovery, Um, especially because in my family and just in society, I think we're very, it's, it's really hard because we're told things all the time, like that feed that eating disorder. So I think just kind of doing my own thing and not listening to those comments and even, you know, just, you would get calm. Like, even if I was like eating a lot or eating like a lot of like sweet things because I wasn't eating because I cut out sugar for a long time when I started yeah. recovery. Of course, that's what my body craved. Right. And so I made, I would have like a lot of desserts and I would be eating all these sweets and like, I would get comments from like family or like, like, wow, that's a lot. Or like, oh, you're just keep. And so like hearing right. those things and seeing people, even like seeing like other people that I knew around me, like going on diets and stuff like that was yeah, really hard in the beginning because it was like this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're supposed to do is like right. what you hear that voice say, and and it was just like I have to keep doing, and it's just like it felt a little bit like blind faith almost. Like I just have uh-huh. to kind of go with this because, and I I looked at people like you said like that had gone through this and come out so much better, and just having that perspective that I don't want to stay where I am now. So I, to do that, I have to I have to just jump, you know. So it was a lot of just kind of literally just like blocking out everything, repeating like the same thoughts in my head. So like, if like I did something and got those, you know, automatic ED thoughts, just being like, nope, you're here. I hear you, but no, like, I'm not like, I sometimes I would just like, like say it out loud, like just kind of like talk to the eating disorder almost and just kind of say like, no, you're wrong. And just like talk to it, you know? So that was helpful for me. But yeah, just honestly, just trying to just ignore things and block it out. But it was, um, took a long, long time to get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much to unpack there. First of all, the I hear you, but no, I, I just love that because I think that really is, you know, doing the work in, in recovery. Yeah. Cause we were talking about like studying recovery versus actually <laughs> doing it. Um, because the thing is, especially in the beginning, like your brain is going to fight back when you mm-hmm. do behaviors that are different than what you've been conditioning yourself to believe for however long you've had your eating disorder and you know especially with the influence of diet culture like it just it it is so incredibly sickening I mean I was in in Bali a couple months ago and Mm. I was at Starbucks um and I was I always like to order like a different milk in my coffee um Mm. (laughs) just like becomes a game for me of like which milk (laughs) am I getting today and I was just like standing there because she was like, we have soy, we have oat, we have cow, we have almond, um, just like the normal list. And I was like, just taking like a few seconds to think. And she goes, how about almond? It's the lowest calorie. Oh. And I was just, it ticked me off so much because I was like, I come to this like far away third world country and even here, <laughs> just like mm. tested with diet culture. Um, Everywhere. Yeah. And, and especially when I was going through extreme hunger, you know, I did not touch a vegetable for months like Mm -hmm. the idea of vegetables just like I was like I I can't like I literally can't and 
all I wanted, you know, was sugar and fat and carbs and yep. Nutella cookies, anything that had sugar or like taste was tasty. I was like, I'll eat it and then give me like 20 hundred servings of it. Um, right. And I remember, you know, my my family being like, oh, like, where does it all go? Like, how <laughs> like how can you even eat that? Like, like and and I just remember like taking a bite out of a stick of butter like like it wasn't even good but it was just like I needed the calories yeah. so desperately that my body was like I'm gonna do these things you know that are not quote-unquote normal and I just remember like people being like that's disgusting but but that just like further you know um elevated the guilt and the shame around it um yeah. and I think especially you know when you are healing your relationship with food like to give yourself grace like to bring that back what you said earlier that it will be messy i think that is also very Mm -hmm. cool because you know you got to this place in the first place by being messy like by messing with your food so to like get out of that place you also gonna it also has to look messy in a way yeah Um, and and yeah with, with the i hear you but no again i just love that sentence because i believe that recovery is about you know having the thoughts and and again, saying like, I'm I'm choosing to disengage because the brain, it's become addicted to having those thought patterns. And the only yeah. way to like unaddict yourself and to like <laughs> new healthy thoughts is by taking different action because the brain learns from our actions. It, it gains mm-hmm. knowledge, it gains trust when we prove to it that different actions and behaviors are possible. Um, it's not going to, you know, be okay with eating a cookie if you've never given your brain evidence that eating a cookie is even a thing you do so Mm. yeah I feel like that's almost where people almost think that they have to do one thing before the other they think they have to change their brain first and then recovery will suddenly be easier but it's like it works the other way around like you have to take the action and then your brain will learn but that's obviously what makes it so scary because taking the action when your brain is saying no, 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 we're not doing that. It's like, you almost, you need to do something that isn't like aligned with your mind. Yeah. Um, so yeah, saying like, I hear you, but I'm not engaging because, you know, we do not have control over our thoughts, especially in the beginning, but mm. we always have control of whether or not we respond to those thoughts, we react to those thoughts or not. Um, and that's, you know, the, the neural rewiring and, and creating new healthy thought patterns is, you know, taking the actions that you want to take rather than the actions that your thoughts are telling you to. Um, mm. And then also I wanted to add to what you to what you said about diet culture and like society. Um, there's this one quote that I love by Rollo May, who is considered like the existential father, the father of existential psychology. Um, and he has this quote that goes, um, the opposite of courage in our society is not cowardice, it's conformity. And mm. I just love that so much because it's it's so true in the sense that, you know, we conform, we do what everyone else is doing because then we think we're safe, then we fit in. But in mm-hmm. the end, like, we're not being brave because we're just going the safe route. Like, that is the easy route because we just copy what everyone else is doing. Um, That's also obviously where masking falls into it. But I think as long as you conform to what everyone else is doing, like you're never going to live a free life because you're ultimately a slave to society. <laughs> to society. Oh, really? um, And that's why courage is by definition, you know, not conforming. It's by doing your own thing. Um, mm-hmm. It's by, by stepping out of the mold, which I think, you know, especially autistic people have to do that because we, we have different wiring and different makeup, but at the yeah. same time, It's the most difficult for us to do because we're so afraid of judgment because we are different, right? Because being different and and standing out means that you run the risk of criticism. Um, But but in the end, I'm like, people are going to judge you anyways. So you might as well be (laughs) judged living a life that you love. (laughs) Um, I love that. So yeah, kind of coming back to, you know, the little less philosophical stuff. Um, (laughs) Um. How do you believe that um, being autistic, like, do you believe that being autistic posed like additional challenges um, in recovery from an eating disorder? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like I I learned about autism after I had really recovered. But looking back, 
I feel like it probably, yeah, did have some impact. I think just like, I don't know, I feel like the natural tendency to need routines and consistency in my life. And Mm -hmm. like kind of what you were saying, it provided that the eating disorder provided that consistency, you know, in a way that I was looking yep. for that I, that I wasn't getting in other places. In and predictability life. too. It's like, I don't have to think about going out because I'm just eating my healthy dinner tonight. <laughs> yep. It's yeah. going to be the same. I know exactly what I can, I know what I can do to make this better. Um, right. So kind of seeing, I think understanding why I was feeling those things, like mm-hmm. with going out and, and being with people, like why was that so stressful for me or being in a, like, for me, like understanding my sensory differences, which I didn't understand till like two years ago. So understanding why I was feeling so overwhelmed in situations and why I was feeling the need to use food to, to make myself feel better. So um, just kind of understanding myself more. But I think, yeah, I think it probably um, played an impact in those things. Yeah. How has your autism diagnosis helped you to overcome the challenges that, you know, you faced in recovery? Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like definitely for me, it was just, it helped me understand myself like way more um, and accept myself um, was huge because I, I just, always, I always felt ever since I was little that like something, something's different, you know, like I just yeah. felt like looking around my family, looking around my friends, like they can all handle this. What's going on with me? Why, why am I freaking out in this situation? Why, why do I feel this way? Um, why am I like studying what to say when everyone's like, it's just, you just talk, it's just natural. And then it's like, no, I need to like, I need to know what I need to say. You're like all these things. So I think for me, it was understanding my brain too. And like, I I love like studying anatomy and things like that. So understanding Mm -hmm. like how my brain is wired and what, what my body needs and how that's affecting what I'm thinking and doing and, and just understanding that and then kind of providing the supports that I need. So, um, giving myself consistency in other ways mm-hmm. and like, and not having to, like you said, kind of conform to always like, like I always felt the need, like I need to do all these social things that everyone else is doing. I need right. to say these, these things I need to um like, if, if it's cause for me, like auditory things can be really overwhelming to, or like, like smelling things, like those kind of sensory things yeah. can be really overwhelming and distracting to me. So like taking myself away or like going um to the bathroom for like a hot minute, just to like relax and like, kind of re come back to myself and yeah. um, just kind of those things understanding. Yeah. And just kind of slowly, and this is something I'm still trying to work on a lot is just like being okay with like letting down the mask more and more and just kind yeah. of myself, but not feeling the need yeah, to be look exactly sound exactly like all these people. Um, so I, I was kind of a tangent, but I think just, yeah, just kind of not, at, not at all. Cause when you said, <laughs> you know, practicing letting the mask off, I, I actually immediately think back to, you know, it's very similar to, you know, you know, the the recovery piece of saying, I hear you, but no, like, I feel like it's the same with unmasking is like when you feel tempted to, you know, do what others are doing or to conform. It's like, I hear you, but I'm going to be myself. (laughs) And so I feel like it's not even a tangent at all. I feel like it's a beautiful, uh, like maybe branch branching off into a new flower <laughs> okay I like um, it <laughs> yeah like it's all about reframing it I believe because I mean mm-hmm. again with the masking like you're not necessarily unmasking just for the sake of it you're unmasking for your own sanity because yeah. for me at some point the same how you know I I just my leap into recovery from my eating disorder wasn't even necessarily like oh I want this wonderful dream life it was initially like I'm, I can't keep living like this. It was more out of pure desperation. I just needed to escape. I, I couldn't, I couldn't keep living that way. And kind of same way with the masking, like it's not sustainable. So like, even, yeah. you know, you start on masking just so that you don't feel so damn tired all the time, you know, <laughs> just so that you're not exhausted, just so you can have some more clarity of mind and focus and, and energy to do the things that you actually love. Like, in the end, it doesn't matter what your why is, what your reason is. All that matters is that it helps you to live a better life, which is eventually, mm. I think, what we are all after. Um, because that's why I unmasked because I couldn't, I couldn't keep it up anymore. I couldn't keep faking it anymore because I was like, I have this whole life still ahead of me. Am I seriously going to waste it trying to be someone I'm not? Like, I know that sounds so cliche and so like, wow, well, th- like this is like the epitome of a self-help book (laughs) but it's like there's a reason why 
all of the self-help books and all of, you know, the cliches are cliche is because it's true. They're true. The, in the yeah. end, like life is about like, you know, living in alignment with your values and own knowing your truth and owning that. Because in the end, like we're not going to be on our deathbed of like, oh, wow, I wished that those people would have liked me. I wished that, you know, I would have been more of a fake, more of a fraud. <laughs> like you're going to you're going to have wished that you this is actually there was a book written by a nurse who worked with elderly women. It's called The the Regrets of the Dying. And she kind of Ooh. wrote a book about what the top regrets were of people who were dying. And oh, wow. the top regret regret was um or the top wish like, I can literally look it up right now, but I'm pretty sure it was, I wished I had lived a life that was more true to myself. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, if that ju doesn't show, like, the significance of unmasking and living a, a life that's, like, uniquely and authentic authentically yours, um, I mean, I don't know, it does. And of course, everyone can do what they want to do. Um, but I can guarantee that ever since, you know, I decided, like, I'm not going to care what other people think about me anymore. I'm just going to do what I want and what makes me happy. I feel this just joy um, and just lost for life that I like I didn't even know existed. Um, I was actually on a walk with my sister the other day and out loud, I just blurted out. I said, May, I am so excited for my life. No, <laughs> like I have never heard anyone say that before. And I was like, Aww. oh, my God, I sound like such, you know, egocentric. <laughs> And she was like, no, like, I'm oh. so glad that, I mean, I love that you said that because no one says that. Um, and I think that's, again, that thing with, with conformity is like people admire and appreciate confidence and they appreciate when people live a life that is authentic to them because that's what everyone secretly wants. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is probably also a side tangent, but not. Um, no. So. Yeah, I mean, especially with, with the routine, I well, you mentioned about how that was a way in which, you know, I guess an obstacle in your eating disorder recovery, I think it's really similar to me, but kind of going back to the philosophical piece, like change is the only constant. And I think mm -hmm. once you can recognize that us, we as humans are constantly changing, we're constantly evolving. I mean, that's what makes us into who we want to be is because we are learning and because we are evolving. Because if I was still the 10-year-old little girl that I was before I got an eating disorder, like, I would get an eating disorder all over again. But I've mm. grown so much in that time I've evolved. And I think, again, when we can embrace that and accept it and, you know, be like, wow, change is so beautiful because it's going to actually help me discover who I truly am. Um, I, I think that's not only going to help you in, in your recovery, but, but also just in life in life as a whole and it it allows you to you know let go of others opinions too because you just see it as like i'm growing i'm learning and any what anyone else thinks that doesn't have to impact my journey have you read my book rainbow girl yet if not you're definitely gonna want to grab your very own copy by visiting the link livelabelfree.com forward slash rainbow girl but you may be wondering what is my book even about well let me tell you Rainbow Girl, My Journey to Living Life in Full Color is a memoir of my entire journey. I share what it was like growing up undiagnosed autistic, how this led to the development of an eating disorder, and all the steps I took to fully recover and become label free. The feedback on Rainbow Girl has been so incredible already. All the messages, emails, and reviews truly warm my heart and illustrate how we need more stories of lived experience in the autism and eating disorder recovery space. Just listen to what Lou, who you may know as neurodivergent underscore Lou on Instagram, has to say about the book. Rainbow Girl is an incredibly gripping read that exceptionally captures the autistic experience of eating disorders, which is so rarely discussed. While reading, it felt like I was simultaneously walking with Livia through her darkest and most vulnerable times, but also that through her experiences, she was guiding me, sharing the light, perseverance, hope, and joy. So much of Rainbow Girl resonates with my own story and experiences as a neurodivergent individual. Livia's book highlights an empowering and authentic message that I will forever carry with me. 
If you want to learn how to free yourself or an autistic loved one from an eating disorder, grab your copy of Rainbow Girl today by visiting the link livelabelfree.com forward slash rainbow girl. So again, that's livelabelfree.com forward slash rainbow girl. Now, let's get back to today's episode. Bringing all of that um, full circle to where you are now, how do you accommodate your autistic needs without fueling the eating disorder? Yeah, that's a great question. I feel like for me, kind of knowing what gives me, like what helps me. So for me, it's like there's certain... I'm like recovered, but there's still certain foods that I just will always love. They're like my just go-tos, you know? Yeah. Like I, I love rice. Like I just literally could have rice all the time. Like, and my family teases me about this, but I love like whipped cream, like stuff like that, where I'm just like, and I, and I like just letting myself have those things without any rules attached to them, without anything restriction about them or like limiting my favorite things, which I would have done, you know? So like just kind right. of letting myself have those things and embrace them, yeah. um, And I think a lot of it too, is just kind of, again, like you were saying, I think it comes back to that kind of just doing my own thing and feeling Mm -hmm. like it's okay. Like you're, you're doing your thing and I'm doing my thing. And I see that this is serving me and just giving myself a lot of like, sometimes alone time can be really great and like refreshing for me too. not too much of it. Cause then sometimes like that's not as helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, And then sometimes you can get, you know, your own thoughts can, can get you. But I think, yeah, I think just kind of giving myself um, understanding like, my own body to a lot of it, because like, I always had a hard time knowing when I was hungry, when I was tired, when I was not feeling well, like all those body cues, just, I never really felt. So I think it was a lot of tuning into myself of like, Oh, I feel really tired. And like, I feel kind of cranky. What's going on? Oh, I must be hungry. So like kind of reading and no getting to know my own body. Yeah. Like interpreting it and I, I mean, learning, again, that comes back to like change and evolving is like, mm. you're learning the ways in which your body communicates with you. And, you know, you are able to do that now because you're permitting yourself to, to be curious rather than judgmental. And mm. I mean, I was actually talking to a client yesterday, and we, we were talking about reframing, you know, judgment to how can I be curious about this? Like, how can mm. I discover what's what's in, in here? Um, yeah. and especially with, you know, the hunger, the tiredness, the fullness and stuff. Um, we were also talking about like the difference between fullness and satisfaction and how I, I personally like I don't I have a really hard time recognizing when I'm hungry, but also when I'm full, um, mm. like I can just eat and eat and eat and eat. And then until my stomach is just like, oh my God, I cannot eat another bite. I'm definitely full. Obviously, I don't always want to eat until that point. Um, So so what was really helpful for me was being like, okay, like how much do I need to eat until I feel satisfied rather than how much do I need to eat until I feel full? Because for me, feeling full is literally like just feeling sick. Um, Whereas, you know, it can be really confusing with, you know, all the contradictory advice on the internet, especially the advice that is just not neurodivergent affirming is like, (laughs) rate your hunger and fullness on a scale of one to 10. Mm. And I'm yeah, but then fullness for me is like always a 12. And I don't always want to feel like that. <laughs> I just want yeah. to be satisfied. But satisfaction isn't on the hunger fullness scale. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, you can't measure that in that way, which then again is hard because as an autistic person, I always want to measure, like not in the literal sense, but like I always want to tangibly be able to measure things. Um yeah. And because the the body, you know, is something we cannot tangibly measure, I definitely do believe, you know, that the the discomfort and especially like sensory issues and sensitivities can arise and then manifest into, you know, disordered eating and not wanting clothes to feel a certain way, you know, not wanting to feel too full or too hungry or all these things. Um, Because it does bring a lot of sensory (laughs) um, input with it. Um, So Yeah. yeah, I think kind of the concluding message of all of this is like we're all lifelong loners and I think it's you know critical and so important that we give ourselves permission to constantly change and constantly evolve and become better um but also like you said to give yourself grace to fall down Mm -hmm. um because it's through you know standing up again that's what makes you stronger so kind of going off of that what would be like your top tip for anyone currently struggling with an eating disorder as an autistic person 
something you said, which I think is really true, like just being really brutally honest with yourself without judgment, but just like really being honest with yourself of where you're at now. What are, what are your thoughts talking to someone who, because there's a lot of different advice out there, but mm-hmm. someone who really knows a lot about eating disorders, who, who's maybe gone through it or who has that really like solid understanding, um, getting help from other people or just reaching out to other people and talking about it can be a really yeah. good step. Um, and really just having, yeah, a lot of grace with yourself and understanding that it's a process and it's going to take a long time and you're going to go up and down and fall back. And that's, that's okay. And just continuing to, to keep working and, and that knowing that you can get there, that it's not, you know, it's not impossible, but you can definitely get there. Yeah. It's not only not impossible, it's 100% possible 100 um, yeah, yeah. Cause we did it which means that you know anyone listening or any parents or loved ones or supporters of anyone listening um anyone is fully capable of recovering from an eating disorder it doesn't matter how old you are what your background is whether or not you're autistic you know yeah. um whether or not how badly you restricted how severe anything is mm. um you know where there is a will there is a way especially i believe for autistic people because when we set our mind to something when we want something we will do anything and everything (laughs) it takes to get it which is you know the achilles heel when it comes to the eating disorder but when it comes to recovery that is your greatest strength so with that said i feel like that's such a beautiful way to wrap up thank you so much everyone for listening thank you anna marie for coming onto the podcast and audience um (laughs) i'll chat with you in the next episode Bye bye for now. Just one foot in front of the other, and you'll see around the corner soon. This podcast has been recorded by your host, Liv. This podcast has been edited by my small but mighty Live Label Free team and the beautiful song One Foot in Front of the Other that you were now listening to was written and recorded by my beautiful mom, Louise Alexandra. I am so grateful for my team and everyone who supports Live Label Free. Together, we are always stronger.